surprise ouster. The acting director of the FBI testifies before Congress as the White House justifies its decision to fire James Comey. Christian persecution. We're with you. We stand with you. The vice president addresses Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox leaders gathering to show solidarity with those who suffer because of their faith. Catholics in Iraq, we continue our reporting from a town in the Nineveh Plain where families are starting over. On the ground in Fatima, Vatican correspondent Mary Shevlin tells us about the miracle being attributed to the soon-to-be children's saints. On EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, May 11, 2017. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you to those of you joining us from around the world for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Lauren Ashburn. President Donald Trump tells NBC News he already planned to fire FBI Director James Comey even before getting feedback from the Deputy Attorney General. The move raises questions since the FBI is investigating Russian interference in the presidential election. The president says Comey reassured him at least three times that he was not under investigation. The White House earlier justified Comey's firing, saying he had lost the confidence of the rank and file inside the department. But the FBI's acting director shoots down that claim. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi was there. Jason? Good evening, Lauren. FBI Acting Director Andrew McCabe testified in a Senate intelligence hearing right behind me today. Just two days after Comey's firing, he defended the former FBI director and called the Russia probe a highly significant investigation. FBI Acting Director Andrew McCabe automatically took the helm of the bureau when Director James Comey was fired. Today, he contradicted recent White House statements. Is it accurate that the rank and file no longer supported Director Comey? No, sir. That is not accurate. Director Comey enjoyed broad support within the FBI and still does to this day. The Comey firing comes as the FBI investigates Russia's meddling in the U.S. presidential election and possible ties with the Trump campaign. Today, the current head of the FBI says the agency will not accept any White House interference in their work. You cannot stop the men and women of the FBI from doing the right thing. The Senate hearing on worldwide threats included the heads of the CIA and NSA. And with Comey's firing, the FBI seat was filled by McCabe. The vice chair and I have to step out for a meeting um, that we can't push off. The two top senators in charge of the Senate investigation into Russia meddling left the hearing for a closed door meeting with the deputy attorney general, Rod Rosenstein which was scheduled before Comey's firing. Rosenstein wrote a scathing memo about Comey earlier this week, criticizing the FBI director's role in the Clinton email investigation. Regardless of what happens uh, by the Justice Department or by the uh, FBI, that the investigation that's done by the Senate Intelligence Committee will continue uh, on its current course as aggressively as we're able to. The two senators overseeing this investigation said they talked about the Russian investigation with Rosenstein, not Comey's firing. And Lauren, today House Speaker Paul Ryan countered McCabe saying Comey had indeed lost the support of senior leaders of the Department of Justice. Do you think, Jason, that we are going to hear James Comey's side of the story? The former FBI director has indeed been invited to testify in front of the Senate Intelligence Committee. So far, he hasn't accepted that invitation. Jason Calvi reporting on Capitol Hill. Thank you, Jason. Joining us now is Ken Cuccinelli, former Attorney General for Virginia. Welcome back to the program. Good to be with you. This morning, Senate Democrats are calling Comey's firing shocking. Senator Mark yeah. Warner was there of Virginia, yeah. um, and they're bringing up Watergate. In your experience as an investigator, is there a cover-up? Can there be a cover-up? Well, no, look, this is an investigator. One of the numerous mistakes that former director Comey made was he was acting like a prosecutor who makes decisions as opposed to an investigator who delivers information. If you think back to last July, he held a press conference as if he was the attorney general declining a prosecution. He's an investigator. To put this in 
uh, more local terms for folks. He is the equivalent of the chief of police at the federal level. So this equation, and you're seeing the media just oh, blow nuts. this. Absolutely they're not only nuts. going nuts, they're wrong again and again and, and again. And why do you think that is? Uh, I know that you were on another network, and there were people who just were talking as if they knew what they were talking about, <laughs> as if they had been investigators. Well, of course, they're in the habit of trying to sound like they know what they're talking about. But it was a little difficult as someone who has run an investigative agency to sit there with a bunch of people who hadn't and listen to all these declarations of truth. truth. Um, and as we're on EWTN, we get to actually talk about truth. <laughs> Isn't that great? All but, right. They're coming back. <laughs> but, um, you know, in, in law, we'd call it Ipsy Dixit, a naked assertion. They just spew it out there. And um, they overlook an awful lot of things, actually ignore an awful lot of things. So let's take the media narrative and say that this is part of some cover-up. Well, look at who the acting director of the FBI so is. So it's McCabe. And it's McCabe, McCabe. And there's no reason Trump should expect to be cut any breaks for McCabe. Why? His wife ran for office as a Democrat, got $700,000 from the Clinton machine in that run. And that was only two years ago. So this is, this is not old, and he actually has a little bit of a partisan cloud around him for someone who's the director of the FBI. Nonetheless, that, that cuts completely against the media narrative that Trump is somehow going to gain an advantage by removing by Comey him. in the Russian So let's get back to the investigation. This morning, Democrats were also saying, look, we have examples in Germany, we have examples in France of Russians yes. meddling in in the election. So right. should our... And historical examples here in this country. This is not the first time they've done this. So should the investigation continue? Sure it should. Absolutely it should. And look, there are new tools. When, let's just talk about Russia messing around in elections. They do it all over the world. They've done it in the United States for many years. But there are new tools available now with the advent of social media and a lot of electronically delivered information. As we saw and, in, in our election where there was right. a huge dump from the Hillary right. campaign. That's right. So sometimes they will use misinformation and lying through, say, social media, fake news, etc. And other times they'll use real information with a data dump like we saw in 2016's election. Uh, so there are a lot of tools they have that they didn't have even just 10 years ago. So it's absolutely appropriate to take a look at how they're operating in our elections and other countries and what impact it might have. And you believe that the FBI can do this fairly? Oh, absolutely. I see no sign that that is not the case. And again, contrary to the conventional media narrative out there, everything that has happened today in this investigation would have happened with or without Director Comey as the director of the FBI. It, nothing has changed. Professionals run these day to day. And by professionals, I mean career civil servants, investigators. Bipartisan. Bipartisan. And they continue to handle this investigation going forward. And you see no let up in either the House or the Senate, even though they're both Republican controlled. They're both clearly very interested in getting the answers to these questions. Thank you so much for joining us. Good Ken Cuccinelli, you. former Attorney General for Virginia. Vice President Mike Pence vows that America will stand by the followers of Christ in their hour of need. He just made those remarks during the first ever World Summit in Defense of Persecuted Christians held here in Washington. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby was there and joins us from the White House with the latest. Good evening, Wyatt. Good evening, Lauren. The Vice President says he and President Donald Trump stand with those who are tormented for their beliefs, no matter their faith. But he says across the world right now, no people face greater hatred than Christians. You know, over 215 million Christians confront intimidation, imprisonment, forced conversion, abuse, assault, or worse, for holding to the truths of the gospel. Sobering remarks from no Vice President gospel. Mike Pence on the plight of persecuted Christians. He says President Trump places the blame squarely on ISIS and their ideology. They are the embodiment of evil in our time. Pence, introduced by the Reverend Franklin Graham at the Ecumenical Summit, says the White House stands by persecuted Christians. Protecting and promoting religious freedom is a foreign policy priority of the Trump administration. Part of that foreign policy means arming ISIS enemies, specifically Syria's Kurdish fighters. It's an effort to recapture the city of Raqqa, a haven for ISIS operatives planning attacks on the West. Professor Thomas Farr, an expert on religious freedom, calls it a critical issue. It's a humanitarian issue. It's an issue about our religion, Catholicism and Christianity. <clears throat>
but it's also about the national security of the United States. FAR agrees that arming Kurdish fighters will help create a safer climate for Christians and other religious minorities in the region. But a military solution will not be enough. Backing from the White House is crucial. Uh, I believe the Vice President. I want to have an ambassador at large for religious freedom who is talented and capable of leading this policy, and I'd like to see that person nominated very soon. Our viewers may remember Rabbi David Saperstein, who has been on our program. He served as the ambassador at large for international religious freedom for the last two years of the Obama administration, but it remains to be seen who President Trump will pick for the post. Lauren? Did Vice President Pence offer any concrete plans to aid Christians in the Middle East? No, Lauren, he did not make any specific promises today. He did, however, state that what is happening to Christians in the Middle East is genocide. The Obama administration made the same declaration last year, but advocates for persecuted Christians hope President Trump will take more concrete action than his predecessor. Lauren? We'll be talking about that a little bit later in the program. Thank you, Wyatt. The Mormon Church announces it's pulling older teenagers from the Boy Scouts as the religion takes a step toward developing its own scout-like program. The religious group, which is the largest sponsor of Boy Scout troops, estimate 130 to 180,000 teens between 14 and 18 will no longer participate. It's a big blow for the Scouts. They've been dealing with declining membership in recent years. A day of violent clashes in Venezuela leads to one death and dozens of injuries. <laughs> National Guardsmen launched tear gas and pro-government forces harassed protesters who are demanding elections. More than 90 people were hurt in Caracas. The country's government has become an authoritarian regime under President Nicolas Maduro. It's led to inflation, food and medical shortages and soaring crime. Francisco and Jacinta Marto will be canonized Saturday in Fatima, Portugal. They will become the Catholic Church's youngest ever non-martyred saints. They are the children who, along with their cousin, reported the visions of Our Lady 100 years ago. Portuguese Cardinal José Sariva Martins pushed their case through the first phase of beatification when he was in charge of the Vatican saint-making office. He says it was the first of its kind. The Cardinal says before the church didn't explore the beatification of children because the principle prevailed that they couldn't exercise the heroic level of Christian virtues. But the Marto siblings earned the designation by refusing, despite threats that they would be fried in olive oil, to recant their visions. Age nine and seven at the time, they held firm in their faith and ultimately Portuguese church officials declared the apparitions authentic. Vatican correspondent Mary Shovlin joins us from Fatima, Portugal. Mary will be hosting EWTN's full coverage of the Pope's visit. Mary, today you heard from the family of the young boy who received a miracle through the intercession of the new saints. What did the family say? Lauren, this was the question that the whole world was waiting to be answered. What was the miracle that led to the canonization of two of the three Fatima visionaries? Today we found out at the press conference the young Brazilian boy Lucas, who was only five years old when he fell out of a window, fell 21 feet, sustained such horrible head injuries, the doctors gave him no hope. It was at that point the parents began to pray, they said. They prayed to the little shepherd children from Fatima and inexplicably their son walked away from the hospital with no sustained injuries when they thought just a few days before that he wouldn't make it at all. Mary, what's the mood like there? Well, people are starting to, to trickle in, Lauren. We've seen people arriving on foot. About 45,000 people are coming on foot. It's certainly joyful. I have to say very peaceful, which is something I didn't expect. I expected it to be a little bit chaotic, but it's very peaceful, very prayerful. You have people here from literally all over the world, Catholics and non-Catholics. We even met a family of Mormons who wanted to be here just because they knew it was going to be something special. Fatima truly does speak to everyone, and you can see that here. Mary, you've been all around the world covering events from the Catholic Church. Tell us how you're feeling about this. 
Lauren, nothing compares to this. Um, there's nothing like Fatima, I don't think, in the history of the Catholic Church. And especially if, if you're a Catholic, most of us having grown up hearing the stories about Our Lady of Fatima. I've been here before, um, a huge devotion to Our Lady of Fatima. I know how important she was in the life of Pope John Paul II, who I worked for um, up until today, and Benedict XVI as well and even Pope Francis. So him being here, him coming here on Friday, is going to be something I'll never forget. Oh, Mary Shovlin, thank you so much for your personal lens, your personal view into the story. EWTN News Nightly, Vatican Correspondent. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Lauren. EWTN will have complete coverage of the celebrations in Fatima, including an international rosary and candlelight procession with the Pope. That starts tomorrow at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. You can visit our website for a full list of special programming at EWTN.com. Coming up, Christian persecution will tell you how different faiths are working together to protect their brethren. And more of my reporting from Iraq at a critical juncture for the Christian community. Every day, Iraqi forces are getting closer to ousting ISIS from its last remaining stronghold in the city of Mosul in northern Iraq. But the clock is ticking for Christians who hope to move back to their towns, now liberated from the terror group. Tonight, we introduce you to one Christian community I visited recently that's starting over. For two weeks, ISIS occupied the Christian town of Teleskov in the Kurdish area of Iraq. While the damage is not as extensive as neighboring villages, there is limited electricity and water. Empty streets echo easier times. Signs warning of IEDs left behind by ISIS, also known as Daesh, are plastered throughout this ancient town. This electrical worker invited us in for breakfast. But slowly, families are returning. What do you think of Daesh? What do you think? You. I? 400 have come back so far. Daesh is not good. Because we go from my house, two years and, and uh, six months. Little by little, store owners are opening shops. This man and his three children sort hardware. Try it. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. This baker spent his morning making baklava. Oh, the families are returning to the war-torn region thanks to the work of the Nineveh Reconstruction Committee, a group made of Christians of different denominations, including Catholics. But Steve Rasha, who is on the committee, says it's now or never to rebuild. What we're hearing from the security forces and what we're hearing from the priests as well is that it's critical that we move these people back in as quickly as possible, especially in the Iraqi sector, that they need to be moving in by June and they need to be really back in those communities by the end of the summer or, or it's going to be too late for them. At Palm Sunday Mass, their traditions took on more meaning. Archbishop Bashir Warda is responsible for this block and is taking care of thousands of Christian refugees who left the Nineveh plain when ISIS invaded. He says Christians have the solution to terrorism and acts of hatred. The only response to this violence is Jesus Christ. This is what we need. And who's going to, to give Jesus to Middle East? We cannot expect Muslims or Jewish to give. We expect from Christians to give Jesus Christ. Warda says the Christians who remain are injured, but able to forgive witnesses that peace is possible here. Samaritan's Purse, a non-denominational evangelical Christian organization, is working to help persecuted Christians in Iraq and all around the world. Joining us is Ken Isaacs, Vice President, Programs and Government Relations at Samaritan's Purse. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Lauren. It's nice to be with you. Vice President Pence said America will prioritize protecting Christians abroad, yet they have an appointed ambassador at large for international religious freedom. 
And Christians, I believe, are beginning to question whether or not the administration is going to take more concrete action. What are your thoughts? Well, I was very encouraged today when I heard Vice President Pence say that uh, Christian persecution, religious freedom, was going to be a foreign policy priority for the administration. I think that that is a great start, and uh, it remains to be seen how they're going to roll that out. I think that there has been a, um, a slow start in putting down all the many different levels of staff that need to be uh, put into the State Department and many other departments of the government. What do you think the next steps should be? Well, um, I think that, the, you know, honestly, I think we're in a situation where the government is still forming in many ways. I know that there are many political appointees that have to be put in. We will be putting, uh, we're working with some congressmen and senators and uh, putting some things forward uh, to help strengthen uh, religious freedom and well, the end of persecution against Christians. I know that you were in Iraq in December. I was in Iraq in, uh, in last month. And it seems to me like what they need there to rebuild is money. Well, they do need money. They need a lot of money, but they also need security. Many of the Christians that I have talked to right there in Erbil who came from Mosul, they don't feel that it's just an issue with uh, ISIS attacking because when ISIS came into Mosul, their Sunni neighbors came out and participated in looting their property and killing their families. So this is a, a, a lot of deep, deep divisions here and uh, at the end of the day, it isn't just about having your house rebuilt. It's about whether or not you can live in community and society uh, right. safe. And this is, gets at the very root of what persecution is. And what? And that is that if something is held against you, action is taken against you because of what you right. believe. And whether or not that you should come back to a home or go to another country where you know you're not going to be persecuted. And, you know, I know that you have put together an emergency hospital in Iraq and are working in that region mm -hmm. to help them. Thank you so much for joining us. Ken Isaacs, Vice President mm -hmm. of Samaritan's Purse. Thank you, Lauren. Up next, Road to Recovery, the push to help the Chibok schoolgirls adjust to their new life of freedom after years of captivity. And preparing for the Pope, we'll show you the scene in Fatima just hours before the Holy Father's arrival. Eighty-two Chibok girls returned to school in Nigeria after three brutal years of captivity by Boko Haram. They're beginning their long road to recovery, surrounded by a team of psychologists in a heavily guarded government building. There are the obvious signs and the subtle ones of a brutal three years in captivity under Boko Haram. The 82 released Chibok girls will now join 22 others who have already begun the long road to recovery in a heavily guarded and until now never before seen government facility. It's like a student's uh, hostel. A good portion of their days are spent in class. They said what they want the government to do is uh, to help them in is to help them in the education of the girls. Amina Ali was the first of the longtime captives to escape from the terrorists' camp. She met with Nigeria's president in May 2016, shrouded under a headscarf, exhausted, malnourished, and holding a baby. The minister says her progress, like the other girls here, is remarkable. We believe by September they should have fully recovered psychologically. And then, since it is going to be the beginning of the next school year, we just enroll them in schools. And she the center has a full-time doctor, a team of psychologists, and a caretaker from Chibok. Still, critics argue families don't have full access to the girls. In terms of uh, order visit, not, not, not at all. I can categorically say that because we have relatives amongst us. The government maintains the secrecy of the program is for security. These are, after all, the country's most famous daughters. The parents agreed. We did not compel anybody that your child must be here. No way. As the center prepares to welcome the new arrivals. I just told them that tomorrow I'll take you to go and visit uh, your sisters that just came in. They started dancing and uh, laughing and here. The end goal remains the same. 
giving the girls of Chibok the education that was stolen from them. And pilgrims now are flocking to Fatima, Portugal to join Pope Francis for the Holy Site's 100th anniversary. Our EWTN correspondents talk to people who say they wouldn't want to be anywhere else. I feel very lucky to be here with my mom. This is her lifelong dream. Um, we have ancestors from Portugal. It's a very special place and um, just beautiful. I'm very fortunate to be here. It felt so welcome and loved here and at peace. That's very special for me. It's the 100th anniversary and I think this is the place to be at this point in time. I came with petitions to like to pray for other people who ask us to pray for them. So I expect my prayers to be answered. That does it for all of us here at EWTN News Nightly. To all of you around the world, I'm Lauren Ashburn. We leave you tonight with more images from Fatima. Good night and God bless.